Welcome into the fan duel. Hurry up. It's Maria Marino for Fantasy Sports Network and Jim Sonis of Number Fire is on hand. It's Super Bowl week. It's <laughs> here, Jim. And we have a single game slate available on FanDuel just for the Super Bowl. 6.30 p.m. Eastern this Sunday on CBS. The Patriots and the Rams squaring off. I'm clearly very excited. <laughs> but as we preview the big game, the biggest game of them all, uh, we're going to give you a whole bunch of studs for DFS and a whole bunch of value plays as well. This segment right here, we'll focus on the studs and we'll start with the stud, Tom Brady himself. Yeah, with, with, with Super Bowls, it's kind of hard to not use Tom Brady in single game DFS. And I think in general, my baseline assumption when it comes to a single game slate, the first question I ask is, do I want to use both quarterbacks? And I think when looking at this game, I kind of do. I like both Tom Brady and Jared Goff. This game is indoors. It's projected to be pretty close with the Patriots, his two-point favorites. And I think that both those things line up well for both these quarterbacks to do pretty well. So looking at Tom Brady specifically in the playoffs this year, he's had a lot of passing yards, 348 yards in the first game, 343 in the second just hasn't quite translated to fantasy points because the touchdowns have not broken his favor. Instead, they've mostly been rushing touchdowns, and that's going to hurt Tom Brady from a fantasy perspective. But that's not to say he can't get touchdowns. We saw him, you know, less than a month ago, or about a month ago, get four touchdowns against the Jets in a single game. He had three touchdowns against the Dolphins earlier than that, back in December as well. So Brady can get touchdown luck on his side. And we know the floor is tremendous for him from a DFS perspective. So I think it kind of comes down to the way you think the Patriots will attack this Rams defense. If you think they'll go at them with a heavy rushing attack, then I think that Sony Michelle makes a lot of sense. But my personal assumption is that they let Tom Brady do his thing because this game is indoors and projected to be pretty close. So I lean towards Tom Brady. I think that he's always a safe bet when it comes to Super Bowl DFS. So I think that uh, he's very much worth that salary at $15,500 on FanDuel. Experience is certainly on his side. Tom Brady projected to reach over 19 fantasy points on FanDuel. Up next, the other quarterback. <laughs> it's the <laughs> it's old school versus new school. And in the new school category, we got Jared Goff of the Rams. Once again, this game is projected to be close, but are you concerned at all about Goff, you know, this being his first time there? Yeah, I think that's always a legitimate concern because, like, if I were personally down there, I think I'd be pretty jittery. And I think that, you know, just like thinking about this from a baseline perspective, it would kind of make sense that they were nervous. And obviously, this is Sean McVay's for Super Bowl, too. So some concerns around that. But this this coaching staff with Jim Fossil and Wade Phillips has a lot of experience, especially in these big games. So I still think the Rams will be prepared. And if they are prepared, this is a spot where Jared Goff could do pretty well. And I think that, honestly, between he and Brady, the guy with the highest true ceiling between these two guys might be Jared Goff. And the big reason for that is because Goff is throwing the ball downfield more often. He has gone deep 21% of the time during the postseason, whereas Tom Brady has done so just 13% of the time. It's a pretty big deviation. And what that does is it gives Goff a lot of upside from a yardage perspective. Looking at this uh, specific game last week when they were in the in the conference championship, Goff couldn't hear because he was dealing with the crowd at the Superdome. But I don't think that will be as big of an issue as they're down in Atlanta. Atlanta fans probably not big fans of the Patriots. And in general, the Super Bowl is not going to be as engaged of a crowd as we have uh, down in New Orleans, especially. So from that perspective, Goff should get an upgrade. I think that even, you know, we look at golf since Cooper Cup got hurt. We kind of look at the fantasy scoring being down, but he did still score 24 points on FanDuel against the 49ers back in week 17. He's playing indoors. And we've seen him play really well in domes this year, especially in those two games against the Saints. So I think that Jared Goff has pretty good upside. I think he'll be on fewer rosters than Tom Brady is on. So I think that from a tournament perspective for this weekend, Jared Goff's a pretty fun play. I will use both in the same lineup for sure because I think that there is enough value to do so. But I, uh, I think that Jared Goff may be my preferred tournament option just because he should be on fewer rosters and has some pretty spicy upside. The two starting quarterbacks in this game really couldn't be more different as far <laughs> as experience level and what they bring. But their projections are very comparable with Goff 
looking to reach about 18 and a half fantasy points on FanDuel and two touchdowns in the game. We'll see which one <laughs> will have the better showing. I think it's going to be really close. But let's turn our attention to another stud. This one, um, maybe like fantasy MVP for most of the yeah. season. Todd Gurley of the Rams, except all you were hearing after the championship game was where was Todd Gurley? So should we be concerned? My bankroll was very concerned and was wondering where Todd Gurley was during the championship round as well, because it was it was it was not good. But I think when you look at the things that Todd Gurley has said, the things that Sean McVay has said, they've all said that it's not injury related. I don't think that Todd Gurley is still hurt. It just seemed like he was rusty in that game and didn't play very well. So Sean McVay said, hey, we're going to ride CJ Anderson. He's playing pretty well. But now Gurley has two weeks to knock off that rust. And Sean McVay has come out and said, we're going to use Todd Gurley a lot in this game. And Sean McVay, you know, there are a lot of coaches that we don't trust. You know, from a DFS perspective, uh, they'll amp up the volume. They'll be misleading. But Sean McVay, to his credit, before the divisional round, said that C.J. Anderson was in the game plan. And that was true. And now he's saying Todd Gurley is going to get a lot of run during the Super Bowl. I'm inclined to believe Sean McVay. And as a result, I think that Gurley is going to, have, going to be on fewer rosters for this slate than he should be. We know what he can do. As a receiver out of the backfield, I think that's kind of the main appeal in Todd Gurley. He's still gotten targets each of the past two games in the postseason, even with the injuries and in that game against the Saints. When it was crunch time, Todd Gurley was on the field. You know, C.J. Anderson got in there too, but Gurley was on the field when it did matter. And this entire game matters. So I think that Todd Gurley is still a player I want to use, even though I think there are legitimate reasons for concern. You could still talk yourself into C.J. Anderson because if you assume that he keeps the same role he had last week, he'd be an awesome play for DFS. But for me personally, I'm assuming the pendulum to swing further back towards Todd Gurley, that knee does not seem to be an issue based on what they have said about it publicly so I'm inclined to believe them and if Sean McVay says they will use Todd Gurley then I want to use him as well so far no reason not to trust Sean McVay's word when it comes to game plan Todd Gurley I'm sure is also looking to have a huge bounce back up next, Julian Edelman of the Patriots. He is a stud for this single game Super Bowl slate. Tell me why. Yeah, I think that when you look at the two guys at the salary, it's Gurley and Edelman. I think that Gurley has the higher ceiling because if they use him the way he did during the regular season, the dude could just be a monster and he'd be a great MVP selection. But I think that Edelman is a safer selection by a pretty wide margin just because we don't really know what Gurley's role will be and we absolutely know what role Edelman will have. That's been a pretty meaty one for Edelman ever since Josh Gordon left. In the playoffs, Edelman has 26% of the Patriots' targets. He has 33% of their deep targets and 20% of their red zone targets. Those are all really solid numbers, and it's allowed him to score at least 12 FanDuel points in now six straight games. Now, you could look at Edelman's numbers and say, hey, you know, there's not a ton of upside here and he is pretty cost prohibitive on FanDuel, so maybe you wouldn't want to use Edelman. But he has also had 20 and 13 points in the two playoff games, and that is without scoring a touchdown in either game. He has had a lot of red zone targets, so a touchdown is possible. So if you give him his seven receptions for 100 yards and give him a touchdown on top of that, there's a pretty good chance that Edelman could be the highest scoring player in this game. So I know the ceiling has not always been there for Edelman, but I think that he is still a pretty solid selection for your MVP slot. He has an awesome floor. The ceiling is pretty good too. So Edelman I think it's a safer play between these two guys in this $14,000 range on FanDuel. And I think that uh, if you're looking for safety, he does make a lot of sense. As far as how he's being used, Julian Edelman has had quite the run, getting targeted 10 times or more in six out of his last seven games. That includes the playoffs. Uh, and therefore just goes on to emphasize your point about a great floor that you can feel good about. Now, how about James White of the Patriots? You also consider him to be a stud, um, a little bit less expensive, which is nice. What else can you tell me? Yeah, it's kind of like the Todd Gurley scenario where in the, the conference championship, we saw James White kind of get phased out. And I think that that could be concerning. It could force you to use Rex Burkhead for this weekend. But 
I think there is a possible explanation for that because, I mean, James White got a lot of work between that Los Angeles game and the game against the Chiefs. You know, he was heavily used, and it's possible he was just gassed by the end of that game and needed a breather. Maybe he got hurt. I think that there were some rumblings around that, too. So there's a possibility the late game usage for James White was not indicative what we should expect during the Super Bowl. And I think that that's kind of where I wind up landing, where I don't assume that White will be, you know, on the sidelines like he was at the end of that game. Personally, if I had to pick between James White and Rex Burkhead, I'm probably leaning White most of the time because there is always big usage well within his range of outcomes in the playoffs, even including that game against KC. White still has 26% of the, the Patriots targets. He has 27% of their red zone targets. And, you know, the Rams are pretty good against pass catching backs. But we talked before about how Tom Brady isn't throwing the ball downfield very often. What that does is leads to really big usage for guys like James White and like Julian Edelman. So to me, I think that it does still make sense to go at a guy like James White. He's a little bit cheaper than Gurley, than Edelman, than Sonny Michel. And I think that that does add to his appeal, too, if you don't want to go all the way down into the immense value plays for this game. So James White didn't have a big role in the conference championship, but I think Based on a story you can tell yourself about his usage in that game, I think he's still very much in play for the Super Bowl slate. I'll just say, we know what kind of day James White had back in Super Bowl 51. Do I expect that much? No, but we know he's capable, so that always helps. Uh, finally, a stud to consider for the single-game Super Bowl slate on the Rams. It's Robert Woods. Um, what... Which receiver on the Rams, like when you're looking at them, why why Robert Woods? Yeah, it's kind of hard to choose because, you know, the, there's a lot of reasons to like Brandon Cooks. I love Brandon Cooks a talent. Like the dude's just crazy fast. He makes offenses better. And in a perfect world, I'd use Brandon Cooks. But this Patriots defense is so smart and crafty. And I think if you're looking at a player they may take away, it could be Cooks or it could be Woods. But the thing that I like about Robert Woods is that he gets more targets than Brandon Cooks, and he's a little bit cheaper than Brandon Cooks, too. Woods is just $10,500, which I think, given his target load, is kind of a steal for this single-game slate because in the playoffs, Woods has 28% of the Rams total targets. And the reason he hasn't really popped off is because not a lot of those targets have been downfield. You look at the, the cornerback play of this Patriots team. They've got really good guys on the outside and they can shut down pretty much anybody. And that does, you know, work on slot receivers too. JC Jackson's been awesome and they could use other guys on Robert Woods and potentially shut him down. But I think, Given the salary that Robert Woods carries, given the volume he gets, and given how much this Rams team may be forced to throw what they get behind, I think there are still enough things working in Robert Woods' favor where you can definitely use him. We'll talk about Josh Reynolds in the value section. I think that he may wind up being uh, the safer guy when you consider his salary, but Robert Woods is getting too much volume to ignore when his salary is just $10,500. So to me, from choosing between Cooks and Woods, I love Brandon Cooks. The revenge game narrative is there too uh once again for him this week but i think that i do prefer woods and i'll take that one thousand dollar savings six receptions or more in five of his last six games that includes the postseason robert woods definitely a great stud option for this super bowl slate i'm so darn excited for the big game <laughs> uh, but we got to take a break and when we come back jim and i are going to talk about all the value dfs plays so don't go anywhere We're back on the FanDuel Hurry Up. Maria Marino once again for Fantasy Sports Network and number fires Jim Sonis continuing to preview the biggest of the big games, the Super Bowl, which is coming up this Sunday and the single game slate offered on FanDuel. So we gave you a bunch of studs already. Now it's time to go through the value plays. And, you know, I got to say, Jim, a lot of people throughout the fantasy football season complain about kickers and the <laughs> kicker spot. But with this format... Uh, using a kicker is not a bad idea, to say the least. Let's start by talking about Greg Zerline. Yeah, you said using a kicker. I'm not opposed to using kickers, Whoa. plural here, Maria, because, hey, we can use any position we want. 
Why not both? Uh, but starting with Greg Zerline, I think that we saw in the conference championships what this dude can do when he is indoors. They call him Legatron for real. Like, the <laughs> dude is an absolute machine. He has scored at least 13 points in both playoff games so far this year. And in the regular season, he was just insanely consistent. He scored double-digit Fanduel points in 10 of 18 games this year. Like, that is unreal. And he never scored fewer than seven fantasy points in a game. The only downside I see with Greg Zerline is his salary. He is $10,000, and, you know, that's not a lot. Uh, it's not a ton by any means. But if you decide to plug in both Jared Goff and Tom Brady and someone like Todd Gurley or Ju Julian Edelman or Sonny Michel, it's going to be really hard to afford Greg Zerline for that fourth slot. So basically what he requires to, you to do is use either just one quarterback or drop down for your third player to someone like James White, Brandon Cooks, or Robert Woods. I am okay with doing that. So I'm going to use Greg Zerline in some lineups, but I think the only real drawback on him is that he doesn't necessarily fit with a stars and scrubs ap approach that I think I will use pretty often for this game. But if I have the salary to get to Greg Zerline at $10,000, the dude is automatic. He has a super high floor. His ceiling's pretty good too. So I think that Zerline makes a ton of sense for the Super Bowl slate, even though kickers in general may not be our best friends for fantasy. Definitely has the clutch gene after what we saw in that championship game and allowing the Rams to make it all the way to the Super Bowl. Now, another kicker, the <laughs> other kicker, I should say, um, Steven Gaskowski. What do you think about him? And I mean, comparable as well in terms of price and the other projections. Absolutely. I think that with Goskowski, you get a $500 discount on Fandle, which is certainly attractive. And I also don't expect Goskowski to be on as many rosters because if you look at like the, the weekly output by both Greg Zerline and Goskowski, it skews pretty heavily towards, uh, towards Greg Zerline. So if people do decide they want to use a kicker, they're probably going to use Greg Zerline more often than they use Steven Goskowski. But for me personally, my preference at kicker will always be to use a guy on the team that wins the game. And right now, the Patriots are two-point favorites. We've seen a lot of public bets go on them, and a lot of the money is on the Patriots as well. So smart people seem to think that the Patriots are going to win this game. And if they do, it would allow Steven Gostkowski to kick field goals late in this game, and it would imply that the Patriots score more points than the Rams do. Both those things line up well for a kicker. So I think that if you look at, you know, what the bookmakers are saying about this game, it says we should favor Steven Gostkowski over Greg Zerline, despite what has happened throughout this regular season. Goskowski has shown upside, too. He scored 22 FanDuel points in one game back against the Chiefs during the regular season. He had 14 against the Bills. So I think that the upside is there for Goskowski. The stability, you know, during the regular season was not there as much for him as it was for Zerline. But I still think there are enough factors in his favor to take Goskowski, take the $500 savings, and plug him in there at $9,500. I think the biggest thing about Steven Goskowski that makes him appealing is this whole business as usual kind <laughs> of kind of situation. He's been there six. Yeah. Well, this will be a sixth time in the Super Bowl. So pretty crazy. Obviously, uh, he's um, he's no stranger to the moment. Let's move on and talk about a tight end. Rob Gronkowski of the Patriots. This is interesting to me because all season long, it was the narrative has has Gronk kind of lost it? Is he not the the top tier tight end that he's been in the past? Um, what do you say to that? And how do you feel about him at this point in the season? Yeah, I think that narrative that you were discussing, Maria, really did accelerate down the stretch run of the season because yeah, in the last couple of games of the regular season and in the first game of the postseason, Gronk really did nothing. But last week, we kind of saw this big resurgence with Gronk where he got a lot of usage for this team. He led the Patriots with 11 targets in that game against Kansas City. Three of those targets were at least 16 yards downfield. One of them was in the red zone. And I think that you know, when we look at that, that's pretty big usage, and I don't want to ignore it just because of the way we've seen Gronk play this year. Like, we don't want to overlook volume just because the player may not have that same edge that he used to have. One of the concerns I tend to have with Gronkowski in general is that we have this, you know, this narrative where Bill Belichick kind of keeps him in the garage to keep him healthy throughout the regular season and may not <laughs> use him fully to keep him healthy. But 
there's nothing to keep him healthy for anymore. It's a Super Bowl, maybe his final game ever. So all all bets are off with Rob Gronkowski at this point. They're going to let him unleash. And if Gronk still has anything left in the tank, we're going to see it on Sunday against this Rams team. Now, he's not the same person he was before. You know, the 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 thoughts around Gronk were there for a reason, but his salary isn't there either. He is just $9,000 on FanDuel. He had more than 100 receiving yards in a game just back in December, like it wasn't that long ago against the Dolphins. He had more than 100 receiving yards. So I think he could go out on a high note. I think that Gronkowski had $9,000 Fully worth that salary if you can afford him as you go with your stars and scrubs type lineup. I think that Gronkowski makes a lot of sense. I know there are concerns, and I think those concerns are legitimate, but I think that his salary accounts for that and last week provided a kind of a blueprint for a big day from Gronk. You certainly like the trend when his most recent game in the AFC Championship, he was targeted the most that he had been all season with 11. Now, how about Josh Reynolds? Um, as we continue to talk about value plays for this single game Super Bowl slate, what about him do you like? Yeah, with Reynolds, I think it's kind of the same discussion we had about Sandy Watkins two weeks ago for the conference championship, where we had this narrative around the Patriots where they're really good and they're really smart defensively. They can shut down your top two options just because they, you know, they want to make you play left-handed. And if they decide to do that this week, that's going to mean they could be shutting down guys like Brandon Cooks and Robert Woods, leaving Josh Reynolds a little bit softer coverage. And we did see Sammy Watkins do pretty well against that coverage last Sunday in the conference championship. So I think that that could lead to a lot of usage for, for Josh Reynolds. And on top of that, he's gotten usage in general so far in the playoffs. He has 17% of the Rams overall targets, along with 25% of the deep targets. And this is a guy who did get red zone work during the regular season as well. After the Cooper Cup injury, this guy was like their main target inside the red zone. So Josh Reynolds saves you a lot of money. He is $8,500 at the same site, the same price as Philip Dorsett, who doesn't have nearly the same overall volume as Josh Reynolds has. So Reynolds saves you a lot of money. He gets you away from those top two cornerbacks for the Patriots. And uh, I kind of think that the best assumption is that the Patriots dedicate those good assets in trying to slow down Robert Woods and Brandon Cooks. If they do that, Reynolds could be stout at $8,500. So I am fully willing to take those savings, plug in Josh Reynolds, and hope the Patriots live up to their motto in shutting down an opposing team's best unit. He had seven or more targets and four of his last six games. Once again, just a trend you could feel good about and potentially a great option to find some value. Moving on, Chris Hogan of the Patriots. He's another value play. Salary just 7500 bucks. What else do you like about him? It's mostly just a salary. I'll be fully honest <laughs> about this. But, you know, $7,500 can go a long way on FanDuel on this slate. When I want to pay for Brady, for Goff, for Gurley, for Edelman, and Michelle, I need to say it somewhere. And, and what Chris Hogan gets me at $7,500 is a player I know will be on the field and I know will at least get some targets. And honestly, that's all I really need for this slate. Now, the debate for the Patriots is do you want to use Chris Hogan or do you want to use Philip Dorsett? Dorsett is $8,500, whereas Hogan is 75. Hogan has 13% of the team's targets in the playoffs, whereas Dorsett has 9%. And Hogan also does have 20% of the team's red zone targets. There's a, a decent chance he could score a touchdown. And if you get a touchdown out of Hogan on this single game slate, he's basically going to pay off no matter how many yards he winds up getting. So I think that when I'm trying to compare these lower salaried Patriots receivers, I think I prefer Chris Hogan over Philip Dorsett straight up, given you know that we know he will be on the field at all times and should get more targets overall. But when you give me $1,000 in savings to boot, I think that that uh, pushes me further towards Hogan. So he's disappointing in general so far this year, and uh, it is largely a salary-based decision. But uh, I think that there is a path to a good day for Chris Hogan, and that's enough for me to take a swing at him at $7,500. And in his defense, I'll say that in his last few games, he's been targeted considerably more than he was earlier in the season. And that just means he is trending in the right direction, which gives you a little bit more peace of mind, especially when you need that salary relief. Finally, one last value play to discuss, and I have a feeling it's going to be 
more of the same in terms of a lot to do with the price tag, which is quite low at 6K. It's Gerald Everett. You are very much not wrong, Maria. I, again, you read my mind here because the salary is so low at $6,000 for Gerald Everett. And I think that when I'm looking at the players available for this weekend, he's probably the lowest salaried player that I want to use at $6,000. He does allow me to use those three big studs we were talking about before with uh, Goff and Brady and then one other stud in that upper pricing register because Everett is $6,000. He is $500 cheaper than Tyler Higby, but in the conference championship, it was Everett who was on the field more often. He played 68% of the snaps. He ran 27 routes compared to 14 routes for Tyler Higby, according to Pro Football Focus. So Everett was getting more chances to catch passes and convert those into points. And he also benefits from the same narrative we discussed around Josh Reynolds, where if the Patriots decide to shut down Brandon Cooks and Robert Woods, that's going to leave softer coverage for guys like Reynolds and like Gerald Everett. They're not going to be trying to shut down Gerald Everett when you got guys like Cooks, Woods, and Todd Gurley on the field. If you plug in Gerald Everett, you kind of have a lot of flexibility on the top end. So I'm going to have quite a bit of him for this single game slate. I will also have some Tyler Higby because he is a, a guy that they have turned to in the red zone and is going to be on the field. So I think that you can use both Higby and Everett. But personally, I prefer Everett. I'll take the $500 savings and take the guy who has been on the field more often of late. If you're going stars and scrubs and there's a bunch of high-priced players you just really, really want to fit into your lineup, uh, Gerald Everett might be the guy that allows you to just fill whatever spot you need and without breaking the bank. Plus, as you said, could take advantage of the opportunity, assuming most of the attention will be on some of his other teammates. Okay, so that's it. That's that's all the studs. That's all the values, courtesy of Jim Sonis of Number Fire. Thanks for that. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you're getting as excited as I am for Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, by the way, if you want more content, you can always go to fanduel.com slash the duel and click on videos or subscribe to our YouTube channel at the Fantasy Sports Network.